coming towards the end of the course right and one of the components uh, that is uh, missing and i want to also cover right is inertial sensing right although in bits and pieces you already have ideas regarding inertial sensing because uh, you are probably using that in some, like some of you are using those kind of things in your projects right so nevertheless uh, i'm going to cover some key aspects uh, about inertial sensing what is uh, what do you mean by inertial measurement units and what are the different things that we can do using uh, such sensing technique right so this will uh, uh, be the last piece uh, of the entire uh, spectrum of things that we have looked at starting from uh, PPG, capacitive sensing, location sensing and so on. Right. So uh, when we talk about inertial measurement units, uh, we primarily uh, distinctively talk about three things, right? And often uh, these sensors reside in your smartphone and many, many uh, common uh, embedded systems platform right like in robots uh, uh, they do have inertial measurement units by which they uh, keep track of direction and often keep track of their position right so uh, it is uh, sort of an important kind of a sensor uh, which uh, serves many purposes not only just localization localization is of course uh, one of them uh, but it's not for a long-term localization as we will see that inertial measurement units often drift right so we can only uh, sustain the correct location for a very short interval of time right? but apart from that there are miscellaneous uses like uh, finding the direction of your motion like what we commonly call as heading uh, so when you use google maps uh, you will see that uh, it's not only giving you the gps uh, location but also it uh, tries to see uh, in where, what what direction you are heading, right? And uh, sometimes they will also combine the IMU uh, data with the available GPS data, that is the raw GPS data, which you are using for your homework exercise. But apart from that, uh, there is this fused location provider service, right? One of the videos uh, from Google IO I have shared, right? That gives a lot of insight about uh, such fusion and how the raw GPS uh, accuracy could be much improved if we uh, tag in uh, the IMU data along with it, right? So it sometimes uh, not only does localization itself, but also aids in localization. Okay, so not alone, but it could it could uh, co be combined with uh, let's say a modality like GPS, right? Uh, which could uh, help you uh, to make the uh, refine the locations further right and uh, not only that i also uh, spoke about uh, wherever you do range measurements uh, the the range measurements occur after a finite interval of time right so once you do a range measurement uh, range measurement right so they they they, they don't take place uh, continuously with respect to time you are following a certain protocol and there are many devices in the network so you have to allow some time in between uh, successive measurements, right? Let's say T1 and then within T2, you get the next range measurement and at T3, uh, you do the next range measurement and so on, or like set of ranges, right? To calculate your uh, location, right? So this could be your X1, Y1, uh, and this could be your X3, Y3. Right? So in between often uh, IMU uh, could be used uh, to sustain the value of location within this period of time, right? This is a small periods of time, which could be often uh, in the order of a few seconds, or maybe a single second and so on, okay? So depending on the scale of the network, right? And how many nodes are there in the network that are trying to range, uh, if you are using uh, time of flight or TOA based uh, system, right? So uh, it's not TDOA, uh, not something where uh the anchors transmit and the device uh, receives right in those cases as you have seen it could be scaled up to a huge extent but yeah there are like bits and pieces where imu could help you okay so we'll uh, look into uh details of this uh three things and in particular we will see we'll uh, focus more on the accelerometer part right that is something that has a lot of applications uh as we'll see okay so uh, what exactly if you drill down inside an accelerometer uh, you see a structure uh, like this right whatever i have shown on the right hand side right so 
what happens is that uh, you see this grid sort of a structure where uh, this is fixated on four corners which we call like the entire structure has this four corners or anchors which is uh, used for fixing the structure to the underlying platform right and if there is a force that is applied uh, right to the uh, system right if it is on an inertial reference frame uh, you will see movement of this right movement of this blue part wherever uh, this red arrows are provided so this is going to be moving depending on the direction of the force right and what happens is inside uh, this comb kind of a structure uh, there will be uh, some dielectric present and because of the distance in between this uh, comb kind of a structure and uh, the blue plate right the distance in between them is going to change which basically changes the capacitance value inside them right so if you do not have uh, any acceleration that is given to the system the system is at rest uh, in that case this the separation will be equal right on the left hand side of this thing you will have uh, the distance d1 and on the right hand side you will have a distance uh, d2 which are equal which basically means that uh, the capacitance on the left hand side is equal to the capacitance uh, that is present on the right hand side right whereas uh, whenever there is a slight push right whenever there is some acceleration uh, that is there because of the force uh, that is applied to the system uh, this blue plate is going to shift right suppose there is a force on this side right so suddenly there will be a uh, like acceleration of this uh, particular uh, blue comb kind of a structure in this direction right so uh, some of the dielectric will be uh, sort of uh, pressed right uh, in a sense so that the this this distance becomes uh, greater and this distance becomes smaller right and from this differential uh, capacitor concept right the difference in the capacitance in between these two uh, sides of this comb kind of the structure you can detect that there has been an acceleration and this acceleration value is calibrated by the accelerometer, accelerometer manufacturer, right? They will try to map the value uh, to some uh, number, right? To, to what is the uh, meter per second square, right? What is the acceleration uh, in a certain axis as we'll uh, see shortly, right? So this is something like uh, putting uh, such a system, right? A spring and ball uh, kind of a system uh, in uh, in an inertial frame, reference frame, right? And uh, if you see, uh, you can imagine that uh, depending on the direction of motion, uh, a certain uh, spring will be compressed and a certain spring will be sort of uh, stretched, right? And you can compare this to be an equivalent or an analog of the uh, capacitance, okay? So uh, that is uh, where you get like a higher capacitance value, lower capacitance value and so on. So basically depending on the difference in between the stress of these two uh, springs, uh, you can figure out the amount of acceleration uh, that is present in the system. Okay. So that is how uh, in a nutshell uh, accelerometer works. And uh, if you actually uh, take a class in uh, sensor fabrication or how this MEMS devices work, they go into much more finer details, right? But in our discussion, uh, it's enough to know uh, from a higher level uh, that what is the working principle uh, approximately of this accelerometer device. So uh, you don't have just uh, the acceleration in one direction, right? Uh, however, uh, you, you will actually have uh, such a force which could be uh, directed like in the in a, in a 3d space right so you will have components of the force or components of the acceleration which are along x y or the z direction okay so uh, your uh, underlying uh, equivalent figure will be something like this right where you have this mass and spring system across uh, all the axes okay which again uh, could extend in a negative direction as well as the positive direction Okay, so uh, the raw accelerometer um, sensor, right? Uh, the, the measurement uh, changes uh, in three different directions, but one thing that is always there is gravity. Okay, so doesn't matter what is the orientation of your accelerometer device, you will always have the 
uh, gravity component present okay and uh, another good thing is that the gravity component is always present in a in a given direction right it is always towards the uh, pointing towards the earth okay so uh, that in in a sense gives you uh, which direction uh, points towards the earth and uh, gravity will show its components uh, it's going to be manifested as a component in both in all the like x y and z uh, axes right so we don't have uh, a specific axis uh, for gravity but the component of the gravitational pull is going to be manifested in the three directions okay and uh, what we will get as an output right uh, is basically going to be uh, the linear acceleration in our direction right let's say linear acceleration in the x direction plus the component of gravity in that uh, x direction or y direction okay so you will get something which is a fused version uh, of all of these things right uh, gravity as well as the acceleration component uh, in the specific direction okay so uh, this is how i'm trying to show the components so if this is g uh, you will have the component of G in uh, X, Y, as well as in uh, <coughs> uh, X, Y, and Z, uh, all the, uh, all the uh, directions. Okay. So now uh, we need to uh, figure out a way in order to uh, tease apart these components. Okay. So uh, once you look at uh, the complete uh, component right the, the output uh, in a certain uh, direction right let's say in the x axis you will see something like this that i have shown in the top right so the accelerometer output will look something like this which we know is a combination of uh, the gravity right so the acceleration due to gravity right plus the linear acceleration okay and uh, it turns out that uh, it's basically the gravitational, uh, like if you call it a gravitational signal, right? Uh, this will have a, a very low frequency. It's not something which is rapidly fluctuating uh, with time. And uh, you can think of uh, this entire change, right? As if you look, if you think in terms of frequency, it will, it will have some low frequency components and high frequency components. And often uh, it is required that we separate out the two right because if you want to know the absolute value of the acceleration like a linear acceleration that was produced right we need to tease apart uh, the gravitational uh, signal from it right and you can you can view this as a combination of uh, the low frequency components uh, which is responsible for the gravity like which is uh, coming uh, because of the gravitational signal and you will have some high frequency components which is actually happening because of the acceleration that we have deliberately put into the system okay uh, let's say uh, you are walking and uh, you are changing your acceleration you are running right so those kind of uh, movements as you see uh, will create this high frequency uh, components uh, in the uh, frequency spectrum of this particular data right uh, the accelerometer output okay so note that uh, this is a time domain signal whatever i have shown here is uh, with respect to time okay so with time uh, how the uh, this thing changes okay so it is sort of uh, important uh, to separate them out and one way to do that is to view that in the uh, in the frequency domain okay and uh, if you are or like and often what happens is the uh, the orientation of the devices keeps on changing right once you let's say you take a smartphone in your hand and you keep on jogging right so uh, although the uh, your the direction in which you are moving is uh, same right uh, however the axis of the device itself will keep on changing right so the device is jerking in your hand or if you are like attached it to your shoulder right it continuously uh, changing its direction right so the devices x y and z could be continuously changing and uh, or sort of uh, not not exactly constant so the component of gravity itself is also going to change a little bit okay but uh, 
that is what we are uh, focusing on or kind of stressing is that uh, that signal will be uh, low frequency right so uh, the components will be uh, on the lower side in the frequency spectrum okay so what do you want to do right how how do you want to uh, separate these two things out basically by using filters okay so we start with uh, the top signal the blue colored signal and we want to uh, let's say pass it uh, through a low pass filter uh, which is going to allow the low frequency components uh, or you are basically going to extract the gravity signal out of it okay and uh, you will find the components of the gravity signal potentially in all the axes right x y and z uh, and all of them uh, might have uh, yeah some influence of the gravitational signal and if you once you get that right so you can you can simply uh, take it out from your time domain signal okay so uh, any accelerometer is going to give you uh, acceleration values in x y and z directions okay so if you are dealing with such situation uh, you have to pass this data through a low pass filter which uh, gives you only the acceleration which is uh, uh, coming from the linear acceleration that is being put into the system let's say this is a robot uh, so you basically you are interested in uh, the motion of the vehicle right uh, so how much displacement uh, it has uh, it has been through right or how much it has moved in a certain direction so in those cases the calculation will become wrong uh, if you also uh, take into account uh, the component of gravity there is no uh, actual movement in that direction okay so this is the trick uh, which you want to use okay so typically uh, imu uh, measurements will look like this so uh, i have shown uh, four activities one is jogging one is sit ups one is running and the other one is static which is the phone uh, lying on the table right so this is a static case right uh, still you will see there is so much of uh, fluctuation in the uh, data okay so uh, if you just concentrate on one of them right uh, let's say uh, on jogging right so it you will, you will see that accelerometer uh, does pick up a lot of the periodicity in the motion right uh, so the top one is the resultant right so this is the resultant acceleration and you also have this x y and z components okay so here right so uh, whenever you try to look at uh, some more analysis on uh, what kind of uh, activity was going on so this data is immensely important to uh, classify that as you will see right uh, apart from other applications so uh, any periodic uh, sort of uh, activity if you do if you perform uh, this data set uh, you have to do some let's say frequency domain analysis or the time domain analysis similar to whatever you have done in your first homework uh, like the ppg uh, data you, will, you can do very similar uh, sort of analysis on this data also right and uh, this is up to your application or the as an application engineer right it is what kind of data mining you are interested in doing on such data uh, based on that you have to decide on algorithms right uh, the, on the specific algorithms right so these are some examples i have uh, given you uh, for different activities and how the IMU's accelerometer is going to respond uh, to such activities so that you get some idea right how the data actually looks in uh, practice and this is something you can even collect yourself and uh, try to understand uh, how such data looks like do some uh, preliminary analysis on that right let's say uh, jogging you can try to find out uh, what is your number of steps taken per second right or what was your velocity so or whenever you are making a uh, step right you can you can you can very easily figure it out right so there is step number 1 step number 2 and so on so this is basically trying to analyze uh, this time domain data and of course uh, this looks a little bit uh, smoother because it was uh, some of this data was also uh, like processed you can you can also appreciate that what are the sources of noise uh, if you uh, if your uh, device right you keep the device in your hand and uh, the phone uh, jerks a lot 
uh, you can also see the amount of noise coming into the system and how can you get rid of those noise. So those kind of experiments uh, I would encourage you to do. Okay, and uh, such data sets are also available, right, uh, in in the public domain. Uh, if you want to, let's say, develop some uh, models, right, uh, which I will discuss later, right. Uh, what kind of activity is going on, right? Typically known as activity recognition. Uh, those kind of there is an another angle, right, where accelerometer data could be used. Okay, so the first application uh, which has a direct uh, relation with <coughs> localization is pedestrian data recording. So this is uh, a, let's say a human being, right, who takes a smartphone in uh, his or her pocket, right, and walks, right. So uh, just based on the accelerometer uh, output, right, uh, not only just accelerometer, the IMU's output, right, which does have other uh, sensors like the gyroscope and magnetometer uh, that I will discuss later, which helps you in uh, sort of understanding your direction of motion, uh, right. Uh, they have developed uh, lots of algorithms, right? This is one class of algorithm uh, known as PDR or pedestrian uh, data recording, which computes your trajectory, right? Let's say you start from uh, this location where it is known as track start, it's uh, shown in the figure, right? And you keep on walking along a path, right? Then the PDR algorithm is going to determine uh, your, your tracks, right? How you have actually moved. So in this figure, as you have uh, already understood that it is uh, prone to a lot of mistakes, right? And uh, another thing is that with more and more passing of time, the algorithm's performance will keep on uh, deteriorating, right? Initially, it might be good, uh, but slowly it is going to uh, be worse and worse, okay? So um, IMU has an immense application in doing this thing, particularly while you are trying to localize in GPS denied environments, right? Uh, we discussed a lot on uh, this GPS denied environments, all the localization happening there. Uh, localization, right? And in particular, we are uh, interested in infrastructure free localization. So why infrastructure free? In this case, uh, you are not deploying any hardware per se uh, in the building. So the only infrastructure that you have is in your pocket. So uh, that is something uh, which you may discount because you do not have to do any deployment or calibration as such in the building. Okay. So uh, there is an immense application of uh, this PDR uh, in such cases. Okay. So. Uh, uh, more formally, uh, so dead reckoning is the process of calculating one's current position by using a previously determined position and, and the advanced uh, advancing that position based upon the known or estimated speeds uh, over elapsed time and course. Okay, so this is a simple set of kinematic equations that we are all aware of. So from uh, your previous estimates, right? Uh, let's say your previous estimate of the uh, displacement, which is s zero. Uh, your previous estimate of velocity, which is V0, and your acceleration that you can uh, see from the acceler accelerometer, we are interested in figuring out what is your next position, how much you have moved. So let's say you have moved to the point S1. And so we are trying to find that out, what is your net displacement uh, from this previous state. Let's say the previous state is defined by uh, S0 and V0. So if you have uh, accelerometer uh, data that is available to you, uh, you already know uh, this value of A, right? Uh, and let's say you have uh, spent an amount of uh, time T uh, from the previous state, uh, and now uh, you are interested in finding out your current state, right? So the time that is elapsed is uh, T, okay? So what is a way to figure out uh, the values of H0 and V0? How can you find out the values of H0 and V0? Anybody? Uh, based on initial conditions. Uh, no, uh, yeah, initial conditions are there, but uh, v, V0 is like, let's say some VI, right? And we are interested in 
figuring out the vi plus 1 right so you ha you know the acceleration right so starting from the accelerometer data what do you what operation do you want to do on accelerometer data in order to get velocity and hmm? sorry so basically you plus at uh okay yes uh, and uh, you uh, let's say you just have the accelerometer data right so what is the fundamental operation on acceleration that gives you velocity or displacement where right, you are close by uh, right but what do you do multiply multiply with time integration integration right so you like the differential of uh, if you what is the rate of change of velocity like dv dt is a right so if you want to find out uh, uh, velocity right this is an acceler acceler integral of acceleration over that period of time okay because a is available right a is something that is available from the system okay and uh, similarly uh, for s0 we have to do a integral of a and an integral of that right over the same period of time okay so as you see here right uh, so this is the only way out right there is no information about velocity that is available from the system right we don't have a mechanism to sense velocity we only have a mechanism right fundamentally to sense acceler acceleration or force right because of the force that was applied right if you uh, recall the sensing principle that we discussed in the first slide right uh, the movement of that mass only happens as a function of uh, acceleration that is provided to the system right so the differential uh, capacitor pair that we spoke about right uh, so the net capacitance uh, that is that is that is basically the underlying uh, analog uh, that we are trying to sense uh, for sensing acceleration uh, that is what we have hold on right so just using a uh, we do an integral of a to find out v0 or like v and a double integral of a to find out s and the time elapsed is we know right because we are sampling the data whenever we are uh, interested in finding out the next estimate so we need to find out how much time has elapsed uh, from the previous estimate to the current estimate okay but now the problem with this thing right is uh, noise right so what happens is accelerometer data as you know uh, as i will also uh, show you or i have shown you right in the uh, in let me go back and show you this thing right it is infested with noise right let's say if you see the running or even if the phone is statically lying on the table uh, you should ideally expect everything to be zero right so your net and uh, you should not have anything uh, like moving right so but still you see there is a lot of this movement right and this accumulated over time right although you can say oh this is a very small value this is non zero but think about it right there is a, this is non zero i agree but what happens uh, if it accumulates over time because you are doing an integration okay so uh, this is although uh, let's say this is uh, the x axis uh, acceleration what will happen if you take an integral of this uh, acceleration value uh, over a period of time you will think that it has a lot of velocity and in reality the phone is not moving the phone is statically kept on the table and this is real data i have actually kept the phone on the table and collected such data and you are welcome to do a similar experiment and uh, please find out uh, the acceleration value and then try to plug in uh, your values right write a small python script and find out uh, what is the velocity after a period of time right let's say after a period of 5 seconds so it, it is ideally should be zero but you will see that you are getting a velocity of 2 meters per second which sort of is completely outlandish and not expected right so uh, the pdr algorithm has to do much more uh, refinement of the uh, noise right and uh, there are like typically uh, lots of filters which take care of them and one one is uh, a kalman filter which is very commonly used uh, I am not going into the nuts and bolts of how a Kalman filter works, but uh, you are like it's not something uh, which is extra hard or anything. But if you if you have taken uh, like this course and you have some understanding of uh, control and so on, uh, you can you are encouraged to look up. And many of you 
probably are aware of uh, Kalman filters, uh, but if you are not, you can uh, look it up, right? And they they have a very uh, nice set of implementation already available, right? If you are putting on uh, some data like this, it need not be just IMU data, right? It could be any data uh, which has a certain trend. And apart from the trend, uh, there is a lot of noise uh, that is uh, infested in the data, right? So the Kalman filter is going to take out the trend and uh, leave the noise, right? Or remove the noise from the data. So this is a very uh, useful uh, sort of a uh, tool uh, that could be used in such scenarios. Right? And for a specific comment on the IMU is that this integral creates a drift and a double integral amplifies that. So the noise in the accelerometer data will be already there in the velocity. So the velocity data will be noisy. Okay. So even if the system is moving at, let's say, uh, 2 meters per second, and you observe the system, uh, let's say, say, let's say uh, slowly, uh, it's uh, let's say you are walking at two meters per second or like it's a one meter per second and there will always be some acceleration that is involved right you will always find out uh, there is an acceleration value and if you keep on observing it for fairly uh, some amount of time let's say five seconds ten seconds and or so on uh, you will see that uh, your your, uh, your velocity is, has increased so much right if you just make the estimate based on the raw accelerometer data, you will think that oh, probably you are now walking at uh, five or six meters per second, uh, which is almost infeasible for a human being, right? And not only that, you are taking this velocity and doing another integral on top of that. So this was already the noisy velocity part, right? And you are doing a integration of that, which gives a tremendous drift in your displacement. Okay, so from from principle, right? From the physics, uh, it looks fine. Uh, but because of the precision of the data or because of the noise, because of uh, so many factors, uh, because of which the noise is introduced in the accelerometer data, this never gives you a very good estimate. Okay, So you have to use uh, different kinds of filters or uh, sometimes they will try to figure out uh, the number of steps taken. Right? Often it helps. Right? A human being will have a certain step length. Uh, which is most of the times uh, sort of constant, right? The the stride length or the step length doesn't change uh, for a human, the same uh, human being uh, so much, uh, right? And if you somehow know the number of steps that is taken, which is sort of a clear cut signature you can get from uh, your uh, acceleration data, as I have shown you in the jogging example, uh, you can figure out the number of steps taken, and this could be used. Uh, for knowing the distance move, right? So there are many, many tricks uh, that you can play on such data in order to know your displacement, okay? So uh, I'm just trying to show you the seriousness of the, the static phone example. So it was uh, the acceleration data is uh, noisy, right? Ideally, it is static, so it has to be zero meters per second square. Uh, and because of this random noise, uh, the location instead of uh, being the this one, right? Uh, the location sort of keeps on uh, changing, okay, with uh, time. So if this is time in seconds, uh, with a small uh, period of time, uh, which is like uh, 300 seconds, which is like five minutes, you will see that you are already an offset of 30 meters, right? Which is sort of uh, gives you a ballpark about uh, how much serious this kind of uh, values can be right where you will see the the uh, acceleration is not really really uh, off right it's something like less than 0 0.01 if you take this entire uh, baseline so most of the noise is within this but still uh, this is the impact right and uh, the, this is a cdf of the uh, offsets right slowly uh, it is going to uh, after uh, the location after five minutes right uh, the location is going to uh, change right and there are many ways uh, in which the offset can be introduced right so because uh, this is one instance right of the random noise so based on how the noise is right uh, i have uh, tried to show you uh, many ways the distance offset can drift right so these are 
uh, many instances, right? Many instances of the drifts of the drift, right? So because of introducing some random noise and a simple uh, simulation, uh, you can uh, figure out that how much in all of these cases uh, the system drifts. And I show you a CDF of such drifts, right? In in very few cases, you will see that. Uh, even after five minutes, it has not drifted much, right? So even if you see the median, right? So which is like 0 0.5 here, the median is like uh, more than 20, 25 meters, right? More than 20 meters, okay? So this is uh, at least I'm trying to tell you that this is a serious problem and you have to use appropriate filters uh, in order to take care of these problems. So the other uh, thing that you can use it for, as I already told you, is activity recognition. What kind of activities uh, is uh, being done and trying to learn those uh, using the IMU data, right? So uh, this is one data set where uh, I show different activities. We have already seen this is like sit-ups, right? And I show you the uh, comp like the different components, right? So the green one uh, could be the X component. The orange one could be the y component and the last one uh, could be the z component the purple one right and uh, this is it's a sit up data okay uh, similarly uh, you can have a jogging data right or uh, you can have running data so or your static uh, data set so these are all uh, different activities right let's say we want to classify okay and uh, this is a fairly common uh, thing that is done using uh, such uh, IMU sensors, right? Not only just data recording, but also sometimes uh, we are interested in the kind of activities uh, that is going on. Right? So this is uh, a fairly established uh, pipeline uh, where you want to provide a labeled data set for your uh, activities. Uh, let's say you give a signature for running and you level that data set as like what happens when a person runs. So you will have a running data set, you'll have a sit up data set, uh, you'll have a walking data set, uh, and let's say you are sitting down, right? Uh, so different kinds of data set you have to provide to the system. And then uh, this is typical supervised learning, right? This is, you can use something as simple as an SVM, right? When you get this uh, data, uh, how do you classify that particular time series data as a certain, uh, certain activity, right? So one more thing that you have to do is that you have to calculate your uh, features, okay? So uh, this is the raw time series data. The raw time series data is of like arbitrary length, right? Uh, when you try to ingest such data to the system uh, with labels, right? Let's say you have activity one, you have this data set, right? You have activity two, you have this data set. And you try to build a model on top of this, right? Uh, this is completely like supervised learning. And one thing you have to engineer here, right? And it also depends on what kind of activities you are looking at, right? Or uh, what are, what is the noise characteristics of your sensor? And so there are a lot of uh, things, right? And you have to engineer uh, the feature set here, okay? So this is not something that is fixed on stone. Uh, you have to come up with innovative mechanisms uh, by which you can, uh, which is sort of best suited for your system. Okay, you could look at frequency domain features also, right? This is one one way to look at it, right? Or uh, if you remember when we discussed about all this frequency estimation and so on, we talked about uh, this uh, uh, STFT or like uh, spectrogram kind of uh, data sets, right? where you have the frequency domain components, but again, stitched together in time. Right? Let's say you have like F1 uh, to Fn, which are like the N frequency domain components, and then you will have it over multiple uh, intervals of time, successive intervals of time, right? So let's say this, you have like N frequency components, and then there are uh, K time intervals, right? So you basically have this uh, sort of a heat map uh, of, uh, of a, like a 2D matrix of size n cross k, okay? Or like k rows, right? Uh, k rows are n columns, k cross n. Okay, so this itself, right? This 2D uh, matrix itself could represent a certain activity, 
okay because often this will take a small like of some period of time right it is not instantaneous uh, like a temperature uh, data right so these activities might take uh, let's say 3 seconds or 4 seconds right only after that the activity has completed so it is often uh, useful to look at such data using such spectrograms right and you can just your task is to classify the spectrogram right whether it is a spectrogram of uh, walking or running or some other activity okay and uh, a popular technique nowadays which is used uh, for classifying such uh, images right this becomes an image at k into n right so you have k into n pixels here uh, right where uh, semantically uh, this is uh, frequencies and this is time right uh, but your for your machine learning algorithm or your classification algorithm they don't understand all these things uh, this will be treated as a, a k dot n right uh, pixels right and you can train something like a cnn right a convolutional neural network uh, to predict such things right which is which has proved itself to be pretty robust for learning image data right so as long as you can convert your feature uh, set right uh, in form of an image uh, you can do a lot of exciting things using uh, using such data sets right so this is another uh, like direction right i am trying to point you at and if you are interested in these these individual things are extremely mature right lots of uh, research uh, has gone in and still these are active areas of research right there are many many open ended problems how much activity you can actually recognize uh, right uh, using imus uh, and how accurate it would be and so on right so there is no limit uh, to this right and you can actually end up uh, thinking of a future world uh, where you can have imu sensors let's say in your hand or on like attached to your fingers and you can completely transcribe a sign language let's say you are uh, making some gestures uh, like the typical sign language we use with your uh, hand right and this could be transcribed in real time to natural language and so that is sort of the limit uh, the future world is headed to and we have to see that wh what what is lacking right uh, whether we uh, lack something in terms of available sensors or the kind of deployment is extremely uh, costly right so there are like different kind of trade offs and active research uh, is taking uh, place in this domain okay so uh, this is some reiteration of whatever i already said right uh, so we, sometimes we are interested in not only just classifying the activity uh, but also we are interested in uh, some parameterization of those activities right if it is uh, running or uh, riding a bicycle or uh, walking right how fast we are interested in that questions or if you are climbing stairs right suppose i understand from your imu signature that you are climbing stairs but now i am interested in learning or under, like knowing how many stairs have you climbed and these are some of these things uh, your fitbit kind of applications already do Right, they take all your IMU data into account, and uh, they will run some uh, signal processing task called some kind of learning prediction task in order to figure out uh, these numbers. Right, how many steps have you taken? How many stairs have you climbed? And from that, and even uh, they do figure out. Right, when I used to use this kind of devices long, long back, they used to give a uh, quality of your sleep kind of a metric. Right, if you actually happen to wear this Fitbit and lie down. Uh, how much based on how much movement you have you had right while sleeping they they try to figure out some of these metrics right which is sort of useful uh, in diagnosing many medical conditions even right okay so uh, this is like one step deeper uh, from just activity prediction right we are trying to parameterize uh, certain aspects of that particular activity we are interested in okay so now let's say let's look at jogging and uh, this is some something that i just told you but i'm just going to take you through uh, one or two slides right and uh, trying to drill down uh, on this parameterization a little bit right to uh, you many of you have already understood uh, what i mean but uh, still uh, giving you some more uh, clarity okay so uh, jogging is like 
you are moving right uh, let's say wearing this kind of a smart watch kind of a thing uh, you could either be walking which is sort of jogging at a very uh, slow pace right you could be jogging or you could be actually running right and uh, this sort of analysis we have even done while using the ir sensor right remember uh, the demonstrations we had uh, i was moving in front of the ir sensor or jogging and all it again created such uh, uh, such a signature but that was uh, based on the ir absorption uh, or, or the voltage that was being observed right but in this case this is a completely different modality this has nothing to do with ir uh, sensor uh, but the signatures right that basically has quite a lot of similarity okay because of the nature of the physical phenomenon that we are trying to map right so as long as it is a human who is trying to move it will try to give you a similar signature so if you uh, do uh, all these things right let's say we concentrate on a certain axis let's say x axis uh, let's say this is y and this is z right so if you are uh, walking slow right you get a certain signature whereas if you are walking very fast right it gives you a certain signature and so on right and this is something uh, that exactly happened earlier right where you are also analyzing your heartbeat kind of data right so in that case what did you do you used uh, fourier transforms to figure out uh, to look at frequency domain components in uh, how to try to understand how what how high is your uh, heartbeat right or in case of the ir sensor uh, we were trying to automatically know that how fast i am moving so in this case also my suggestion is that uh, you can use the same set of tools right those tools are agnostic to the sensor modalities you are using so the principle is that once you get hold of this certain kind of data right no matter what is your sensing modality it could be ir it could be ppg kind of a thing it could be accelerometer uh, the the same set of principles apply right that is the reason we spent a long time in describing all these principles okay so uh, this is about uh, some potentially you can uh, try to do frequency domain analysis of this right but one thing uh, that you have probably also noticed and we spoke about this thing earlier right while describing the pdr is that you could be having a lot of noise in the data right so one uh, necessary thing that we have to do is how do you clean up this high frequency noise okay so presence of the high frequency noise uh, is sort of uh, disturbing your uh, like sort of the, the data set and we are mostly interested about uh, in this case low frequency event right let's say the rate of jogging right you are not uh, jogging at 30 hertz or 20 hertz right uh, let's say we are interested about 1.5 hertz or 2 hertz or some some of the numbers like that right so one idea is that we can use a low pass filter to retain the low frequency components and get rid of the high frequency components okay so because this is sort of supervised you already know that what kind of frequency ranges you are looking at right so that that makes you uh, take a conscious decision that i am trying to look at this band right so let's say zero hertz to uh, four hertz right and anything more than four hertz i'm not interested about those kind of uh, results right that could be simply artifacts of noise okay so one of the techniques uh, that many of you have already used in your homework but uh, uh, this is just reiterating the same thing right butterworth filter is uh, one common methodology uh, which could be very easily implemented and this could be used as a high pass low pass or a band pass filter right so high pass basically uh, makes sure that the, if you want to uh, know the high frequency components whereas in case of low pass you are interested in knowing the low frequency components and in case of band pass uh, you give at your frequency range right suppose you want to know all the frequency components in all of the uh, frequency that lies between let's say f1 to f2 let's say 2 hertz to 6 hertz you are interested in right that is the uh, that is the part of the spectrum uh, you are interested in right so based on that you have to tune the filter uh, in that particular order okay so some code which is uh, something that you can very easily consult uh, 
of this SciPy library and see. Uh, so the first thing that we do is that uh, in SciPy signal, uh, there is this butter, which is the butter word filter, right? We mention an order, right? Uh, and then uh, what is the frequency that we are interested about, right? So frequency, this is the thing that we have to supply to the system. Uh, you have to know the sample rate, right? At which the signals were coming. Otherwise, uh, it is very, it is kind of impossible for the system to figure out uh, the frequency, right? If it doesn't know what sample rate you are operating at, okay? And uh, this is how you can uh, get the filtered signal, okay? So uh, from here, you get the, this numerator and denominator coefficients, right? So these are like uh, two sets of data. And uh, these two parameters has to be provided uh, because you want to uh, cut them off, right? You basically, if you are interested in only the uh, lower frequencies. So L filter is going to do that. And you need to provide uh, your original signal, right? And give them these two parameters, which is going to uh, give you only the components, the lower frequency components that you are interested about. Okay, so anything less than your desired frequency will uh, be there in the filtered signal. Okay, so if you see uh, a comparison, so this was an input, right? Uh, and all the spurious frequency components, all these kind of spiky things, right, are off, right? They, these are all taken out. Uh, even more uh, here, right? If you see, uh, we are more interested in the uh, slowly changing, uh, like the lower frequencies, right? So those things are there, whereas all the high frequency stuff has been taken out. Okay, so this is sometime uh, necessary, right? If you want to do some more uh, critical analysis of your data, it is better to get rid of the high frequency noise. Okay. Uh, this is a repetition that I have done for uh, various data sets. So sometimes it might happen the data already looks clean because it was very carefully collected. Right, uh, but in the wild, right? If you uh, deploy some kind of an app, you uh, and people use it, right? You cannot enforce people to uh, behave in a certain manner, right? So they will do what they want to do, and uh, this is up to your algorithm, right? The smartness should come from your algorithm. How intelligently you are doing this noise filtering? Okay, so uh, same thing, right? Uh, for uh, different. Uh, kinds of data set. Uh, as you see, like uh, in these cases, uh, lots of this high frequency things uh, has been taken out. So this not only for uh, IMU data, right, but for any data sets, whereas wherever you see there is a scope of uh, removing these high frequency components that you are not interested about, or they are just going to add more confusion to your analysis, uh, you are always uh, encouraged to run uh, some filters like this and then try to analyze the data, okay? So uh, this is simply applied on the data set and uh, after, uh, the, after the filter data set is uh, obtained, right? And we can look at the frequency domain components of that, right? Now it becomes much more uh, cleaner, right? Because of the filtered data, and right? you don't have the high frequency components present. And in this case, you can do a simple classification exercise Right, based on what frequency components you are getting uh, for a certain certain type of data. Right, so the first one, right, uh, which was uh, the moderate walking, right. So all these three uh, are moderate walking along x, y, and z. So uh, you can you can create your own uh, metric uh, how to combine these results and uh, try to come up with a single frequency. You can always take an average, right. Uh, so that is up to you. Okay. So uh, in order to, or sometimes the, uh, all the values matter, right? What was your uh, frequency component in the X, Y, and Z direction, okay? So if you see uh, in case of uh, walking or this moderate walking, you see uh, the component along this X is one, whereas in the other uh, Y and Z, uh, this is 0 0.5, right? It's like half hard. So sometimes uh, there is a relation, right? So the movement along the x-axis, the frequency is twice, right? Probably you are moving your hand backwards and uh, forwards, right? Uh, at, at a rate which is twice than, uh, let's say, 
uh, you, your stride, right? How many times you are striding, right? So every time you take one step forward, you are probably moving your hand uh, forward and backward two times, right? So this could be some of the minute reasons uh, why uh, such uh, data is observed, okay? And uh, your classification algorithm is going to digest such data and uh, build appropriate models, right? So there is no uh, particular recipe that I can uh, teach you, right, which is applicable for all cases, right? But I am giving you some idea nuggets, right, which you can use to develop your own uh, activity recognition or classification system. Okay, so now uh, there is one more uh, modality that we are going to take a look at uh, in uh, a little bit lesser details, right, not as detailed as, as we have seen in case of accelerometer. So gyroscope. Uh, is responsible for giving you the angular velocity along the three axis and they have special names right uh, one is known as uh, the pitch right uh, as you can see how much it is the phone is rotating in this direction one is called a roll so if the phone uh, rotates on the left hand on the right hand side direction and this is the yaw so if the phone rotates along this axis okay so this is uh, more applicable for systems like drones, right? When uh, a drone flies in the air, uh, it can tumble across, right? So uh, you always have to maintain a certain pitch, right? Otherwise it will topple, right? The pitch, roll and yaw, this constantly uh, has to be uh, stabilized, right? And uh, for that purpose, uh, the IMU uh, data processing becomes extremely important in such systems. Right, or even in a robot, but in, in particular in, in case of drones, right? Because otherwise you yes. will see the drone continuously toppling in the air and it is going to crash. So these figures are something which are which has to be calibrated continuously for uh, a drone flight. Okay. So uh, the gyroscope is basically uh, the principle uh, lies on something which is uh, already uh, 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 a profound uh, sort of an effect uh, which is seen in many many uh, situations including uh, our art right how the tides and the clouds uh, move right so this is uh, something known as the Coriolis effect right and uh, the gyroscope senses angular velocity relative to itself and which is uh, measured because of its own rotation using an inertial force known as the Coriolis effect okay so uh, this is the fundamental principle on which the measurement of the angular velocity is based upon okay so the gyroscope uh, oscillate at a relative high frequency in order to measure this and are thus one of the most power hungry motion sensors so whenever you have this imus activated they do uh, consume a lot of power uh, right uh, because of the rotation of the gyroscope itself right in case of earth our earth rotates right itself at a very high speed uh, on its own axis right and uh, you can always appreciate uh, the tidal movements or the, the movement uh, of the ocean currents right which are all happening because of uh, such coriolis effects okay so what exactly do you get here so the gyroscope data is going to give you angular velocity which is radians per second so how much angle it travels, right? Omega is equal to delta theta by delta t, right? So the rate of change of uh, angle, okay? And uh, this angle, as you have seen, we don't have x, y, and z. Instead of that, we take the angular rotation or angular velocity across this x, y, and z axis, right? Which is basically this roll, pitch, and yaw, okay? So instead of x, y, and z, in this case, we always call it uh, roll, pitch, and yaw. And we are mostly, uh, the problem here is we are interested in knowing the angle because all we are interested in is in solving the problem of localization where uh, we, we, we really uh, need to know the displacement. But apart from displacement, we are interested in the vector in which the person is moving, right? We need to know also the heading, right? Which, what is the direction of the movement, okay? So if we need this angle, we can do it. Uh, in a similar way, right, where we integrate uh, the output once, right, if we get angular velocity, if we integrate over a certain period of time, uh, we can know uh, what was the previous 
uh, rotation right what was the delta theta that was uh, that was uh, added to the system in the uh, from the last state right so the theta is equal to theta previous plus omega into delta t okay so if you take into account uh, this uh, uh, signature right uh, where uh, the uh, input is cos of uh, 2 pi f t omega so 2 pi f is basically uh, the omega right uh, it comes as uh, 1 by 2 pi f into sin uh, 2 pi f t okay so this is the uh, output if you uh, try to integrate it once okay but again you have to uh, be aware uh, like the way we were aware in case of accelerometer that the integration uh, turns uh, noise into drift right if there is a small noise in angular velocity and if you try to integrate that so this will manifest itself in the delta theta okay so the delta theta will have some uh, non trivial amount of noise so this is the delta theta that you will estimate okay it is the original delta theta plus epsilon which is coming from the uh, spurious noise integrating the spurious noise okay and uh, one another good thing is that uh, if your uh, frequency is very high right because of this 1 by f component if your frequency is very high uh, then the noise will uh, disappear after the integration because of this component right 1 by f okay but if you have low frequency uh, that will be amplified uh, because of this integration right and the gyroscope will drift over time so uh, here one trick is uh, let's say this is the system where uh, we want to figure out the angular drifts right so uh, this kind of a wheel which is rotate uh, which is uh, fixed with some controller and we are moving in a forward direction right and let's say there is a drift like this in case of the uh, angle right so whatever we call here is the tilt angle theta so there are two ways to measure right how can you measure uh, theta one using uh, the linear acceleration right where theta could be sine inverse of the acceleration output divided by g right uh, which is only good in the long term okay because of the uh, noise that is already present right uh, so it is not proper if it is uh, way moving very very fast right if theta fluctuates very fast this is not a good idea uh, whereas uh, uh, this is uh, we can do the calculation in another way where we can look at the angular velocity and integrate that uh, over time so this is not good over long term right because we are uh, interested in high frequency components in case of the angular velocity right if you if you have f which is very high uh, then only the noise will disappear if f is high uh, then only uh, the noise that is introduced because of the integration can disappear right so one of the uh, ideas like key ideas that we uh, use here right is a combination of two right you will find it in in many many uh, uh, cases right in in one of uh, the case where we deal with imu we call it uh, this complementary filter or fusing these two sensors right the sensor fusion where uh, we try to use the angle from the gyroscope only for looking at high frequency components right and we are interested in the looking at the accelerometer data when we are interested about in the low frequency components right so this is more suited for low frequency and the gyroscope thing is more suited for high frequency because in this case uh, if it is a high frequency 1 by 2f will become negligible right and this is going to get rid of the noise okay so on top of this data if we use a high pass filter uh, we can get the angular drifts uh, very nicely by reducing noise and in case of the lower one where we can take the accelerometer data and then try to uh, do the sine inverse of the linear acceleration divided by the g right we can apply this for the low uh, for the low frequency components and right? this will be good in the longer term right things that are changing very slowly so this is one way uh, how we can combine uh, these two sensors uh, based on the sensitivity to the frequency right so this is as we see uh, this is more uh, sensitive to uh, low frequency so we use it for high frequencies 
and this one we use it for low frequencies right uh, and there are like many many uh, examples like this where multiple sensor modalities could be fused right by taking the appropriate trade off into account okay and last but not the least i am just going to touch upon the fact that uh, magnetometer is uh, one more thing that is uh, uh, available in the imu units and their sole purpose is to give you the alignment with respect to the earth's magnetic north or south right and this is very erroneous because if you come in uh, very close to ferromagnetic materials like you are very near to an elevator or you are ne near to a, a to an iron shelf right uh, in that in those cases uh, they show uh, really noisy uh, data right so uh, you have to you cannot use this just alone uh, for the comp let's say our compass application you have to use it in uh, combination with the gyroscope accelerometer and then uh, magnetometer could be fused with that particular data in order to get uh, your compass angle or the azimuth angle uh, what is the azimuth angle the angle in which you are moving okay so this sort of uh, gives us a broad idea about uh, the imu sensors and the potential sensing applications that you can uh, use uh, such sensors in right uh, right not only just localization but as well as uh, activity recognition right it's a huge uh, scope of applying imu sensors for activity recognition and sometimes uh, gesture recognition also right let's say if you attach such imu units to your hand uh, and make certain gestures right uh, those gestures could be recognized and be translated into actions to a iot device okay suppose you want to uh, you are playing a game right and uh, by, by by the movement of your hand you are trying to convey some commands to the game maybe move to the right move to the left and so on right so this is not purely activity recognition or localization this is more of i would call gesture recognition okay so uh, you are encouraged uh, this is a large like big field right and if you are interested about it some of you are already doing projects on this right and uh, i would give you one or two very uh, fundamental work that has gone uh, in activity recognition or gesture recognition using imu sensors as well as for pdr right and you can take a look at it right and i have already shared uh, with you a couple of uh, videos from google right who try to integrate such concepts in their mapping application so this will give you a lot of uh, works that are being done in the industry right so that is why i try to share not only just academic papers but also what the industrial research labs uh, think right in terms of such problems okay i'll uh, keep it till here as long as this uh, imu is concerned or the inertial measurement units are concerned and uh, this is like the concluding uh, class right uh, because next week uh, 12th we are going to have the exam right and this is fairly the spectrum of ideas uh, that we have covered in this entire semester right so i'll just take one more minute uh, from your schedule and uh, finish off the class right so we did a lot of uh, drill down into the low end microcontrollers the 8 bit microcontrollers and you should have a fairly good amount of idea on interfacing sensors to this uh, 8 bit uh, arduino devices right uh, in particular, we looked at in in detail. We looked at things like analog to digital converters, as well as uh, analog interfacing, right? How to interpret analog data and when it comes in the digital form, as well as digital sensors like interfacing I two C or uh, SPI bus, right? Uh, sensors using those uh, serial bus and so on, right? And apart from that, uh, we also looked at different sensing uh, model like toolkits, right? Uh, frequency domain analysis how, what is a fourier transform what is a spectrogram uh, event detection right all this uh, neman pearson lemma and so on right and then we discussed uh, four concrete uh, aspects of uh, sensing right starting from uh, ppg then we spent a lot of time discussing about capacitive sensors and what kind of human computer interaction devices could be uh, imagined in the near future uh, that uh, takes into account such capacitive sensing uh, then we looked at gps iot localization and sort of wrapped up with inertial sensing right so there is a lot of uh, people who are interested in further studies like higher studies if you want to uh, go into the human computer interaction domain or 
just like iot uh, development uh, or iot networking kind of thing right so these are like very important things to take away and uh, if you have more questions not only just exams or homeworks but in general right i would be happy to talk to you so just uh, drop me an email if you want to have a continued discussion right uh, about how you enjoyed the class or if there are more suggestions you want to uh, pitch in uh, i would be happy to listen to you